Welcome, I'm Denise Graves, and you're watching Opera America's Oral History Project. Well, um, George Shirley, welcome. It is so good to have you with us today. Uh, you are a legend in our field. Uh, you've been awarded the uh, Medal for the Arts by President Obama. You will be inducted into our new Hall of Fame here at the National Opera Center. What an honor to have you. Thanks for taking this time today. Well, thank you, first of all, for so honoring me. And I'm, I'm naturally delighted to be the subject of this award. And uh, thank you. I'm, grat well, I'm grateful to you. Know, you. Nothing that you haven't earned time after time after time. And in terms of our chat today, you know, Opera America's 50th anniversary was in 2020. And as you can imagine, our plans for the 50th anniversary were cut a little bit short. So we're catching up with ourselves and we wanted to interview 50 people we felt had made an indelible impression on American opera in the last 50 years. And you are absolutely one of them. So again, we're just delighted to, to have you here. And, and as I always do, I, I start out by asking who brought you to your first opera? <laughs> The very first operatic experience I had was when I was a senior at Wayne University in Detroit. Was the Department of Music was not an opera department. It was a music education department. I was pursuing a degree in music education. My senior year, the Glee Club director, Dr. Harry Langsford, came to me and said, I want to do Oedipus Rex for soloists and for male chorus. He said, take a look at the role of Oedipus. I said, okay. <laughs> so I did. We did three performances at the Just Jesse Bonstell Playhouse on Woodward Avenue in Detroit. And I loved it. I, I, I enjoyed it, but it didn't speak to me as a way of life. In my household, it was spirituals, church music, and Grand Ole Opry on Saturday afternoons. Sure. So, this was something new for me. It was, it was a great experience, but I, it didn't make me change my professional path. I graduated with a degree in music education. I taught high school music, had a perfect job, and Uncle Sam came along and interrupted that with the draft. Korea had ended about a year before I graduated, but the draft was still alive and well. So I wound up entering the Army as a member of one of the bands, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Yep. I had heard about the Army Chorus being formed in 1956 when I was drafted, but I didn't go and audition. It was a three-year commitment, plus the fact that the band, the parent organization of that unit, had never had a Black member. It was founded in the 1920s. So I thought, I'm not going to go and audition and for no reason at all. But after about three weeks of playing in the band and my second eight weeks of training, I thought, I'm, I'm not going to be able to take this for two years. So I went and auditioned, and to my great surprise, they accepted me. So I met wonderful singers in that organization because during still the draft was on, and for young males who were facing the draft, if they sang, guess what? They were going to audition for the Army Chorus, even though it was a three-year commitment. Mm -hmm. And so they took me in for two years because I was the first Black member, and I know that they the conductor of the chorus at that time, Captain Samuel Laboda, had to go to the Pentagon to get me admitted into that organization as the first Black member of the band organization. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I met wonderful singers who went on to have careers in opera and what have you, and one of whom, a fellow named Jack Gillespie, had a career singing in Heidelberg, Germany after the Army, and then came back and ran the opera program at Texas Tech producing students like Susan Graham and Terry Cook and others. But Tom, he was, Jack was studying with uh, private students, uh, sorry, private teachers in Washington as most of the members were. And he kept urging me to come and sing for the man he was studying with, a man named Timmy Georgie, who had had a career in Germany and in the States early in the last century. And he was teaching privately in his home in Washington so just to get Jack off of my back, keep from pushing me, I went to sing for the old fellow. And he said, the, the man 
who had to know there weren't any black tenors, many black tenors singing opera at that point in the 50s. He looked at me and said, you study with me one year, I guarantee you'll have a career. I thought, you got to be joking. But I thought, okay. Uh, I, I was looking forward to going back and resuming my teaching position, which was waiting for me. And I thought, well, suppose I go back and 10 years down the road, I kicked myself for not finding out if the old guy knew what he's talking about. So I decided with my wife, my new wife's uh, permission <laughs> agreement to sign up for the extra year that they hadn't insist on, mm -hmm. insisted on so I could have a, an income and benefits to take right. care of her and our in, infant daughter who was born in Washington. And I started studying with him. Now, before that happened, this would be in 1957, we took a trip, the chorus took a trip to California to sing for an ROTC convention, and the captain put a, together a concert with the Denver Symphony at Red Rocks Amphitheater mm -hmm. on the way back. So we had about three days free, and I and three of my colleagues in the chorus, one whose name was Ara Barbarian, who you will know very well. Oh my goodness. Ara took a degree in law from the University of Michigan and sang in the glee club. He was not a music major. But he never used that degree and wound up singing for 20 some years at the Metropolitan Opera. Ara, we, we, we drove, we took a, we rented a car, drove up into the mountains and wound up in Central City that afternoon, walking down the main street. And Ara saw someone he'd been in law school with at Michigan. This fellow was the chief tour guide for the summer and also the chief usher for the opera. Opera, there was an opera company in, in, in Central City. And they were doing Rigoletto that night. So we received four free tickets <laughs> to see Rigoletto with Frank Guerrera, Joan Carroll, uh, uh, O.C. Hawkins, and John Crane. John Crane was a tenor who sang with the New York City Opera. And so I'm there seeing my very first opera, 1957, and listening to John Crane rattle the walls. And I thought to myself, Gee, it's a good thing I never wanted to be an opera singer because I can never do that all night long. Not realizing that four years later, I would make my debut at the Metropolitan Opera, singing with Frank Guerrero in Cosi Fantutte. Wow. And then two years later, singing the American premiere of Alban Berg's Lulu at Santa Fe with Joan Carroll. Right. Well, I, this was before I made the decision to study with Timmy Georgie. When I signed up for the extra year. I got a call about two weeks after I signed up from a woman named Sally Tournau, who said, I have a small opera company in Woodstock, New York. We do a summer season in Woodstock. She said, we've just lost one of our tenors. And our bass told me to call you. Well, the bass was our barbarian who had just gotten out of the course about a month before I was supposed to get out. But he didn't realize after he had left that I had signed up for an extra year. He told her to call me. And I said, gee, I just signed up for an extra year in the Army. I'll be looking for work when I get out in 1959. She said, well, OK, come up and audition for us in January of 58, and we'll see how it goes. I went up, auditioned for them, and they gave me a contract for the summer of 59. That was my debut season, singing everything in English. I made a debut as, in this little theater that seated 250 people with two pianos. And I made my debut as the uh, Fleder as as, uh, as Eisenstein. Mm -hmm. I sang Rodolfo, I sang Harun in Bizet's first opera, Jamile. I sang Belmonte in the abduction from Seraglio, and I sang Torquemada in Le Espanol. The first night I walked down on stage in this little theater, Fred Popper playing one piano, Philip Eisenberg playing the other, I knew I was home. Wow. I knew I was wow. doing what I was born to do. It was wow. You know, it, it's just, it's, it's incredible how, you know, it, it's not, it was not a goal of yours, and it, it unfolded for you. In, in a really organic way. When you were singing in the church, when you were in elementary or middle school, did people say, hey, you know, George, you have a really, you have a nice voice. You know, did you get solos at church? Uh, yes. Did you know you had this gift? 
when I, we moved from Indianapolis <coughs> when I was six in 1940, but before that, I was born to parents who were musical, not musically literate. My mother, I think, possibly read music. My dad played three instruments all by ear, didn't read mm -hmm. music. He played fiddle, piano, and guitar. He was my first accompanist in church. My mother and I and my dad, we would sing for social events in churches in and around Indianapolis, as well as in church, at our church. My parents entered me in my first competition when I was five years old. There was a big department store in downtown Indianapolis, Blochs, and they had a children's hour. And I auditioned with an old Bing Crosby tune, There's a Gold Mine in the Sky. My dad played for me. I won second prize. The first prize went to a, a little girl who sang and danced to one, two, buckle my shoe. Uh, my prize was to make my first recording. Ah. And I, I can recall standing in the recording studio watching the wax peel off of the disc as it was being carved. And, and you're a, a five-year-old child. At the end, I, my parents had that recording and they lost it when they moved in 1971. But I can remember listening to the recording, this little voice singing, and at the end of the recording, this voice said, my name is George Irving Shirley and I'm five years old. That was my first recording, not realizing that it would be one of a few to follow as a professional. So wow. my musical life began in my family. Yeah. When we moved to Detroit, and I started in the first grade, I started at the age of six in the first grade because my parents didn't uh, place me in, in school when I was in Indianapolis. Detroit had arguably the best system of music education in this country. If you look at the records, so many professional musicians, classical and jazz, came from Detroit. Starting in the first grade, we had a music teacher who had his or her own room with all they, they needed to teach music to children. By the sixth grade, if you had any musical talent whatsoever, you could read music. You were musically literate. Junior high school, we had a wonderful choir. Senior high was fabulous. Northern high school, where I went, was basically a black school. There were two basically black schools, Miller and Northern both of which produced musical talent. Cass Technical High School in Detroit was one of the premier high schools in the country at that time. They, young people went there to major in disciplines, science, arts, music. And I went to Northern. The musical experience I had there under my teacher, a woman named Claire Weimer, who was Canadian, was second to none because she gave us at Northern musical literature that was equal to the literature that was being given to Cast Tech students and other students in the white schools. 11th grade, I began to sing the tenor solos in Messiah because we did Messiah every year. Mm -hmm. And we had an alumni chorus who came back to join us. We did it with organ, not orchestra. Mm -hmm. My first experience singing anything from the Verdi Requiem was on one of our spring concerts when we did the Kyrie and I sang the tenor solos. Wow. When I graduated. Which is not, which is not easy music. I mean, not, it, easy, not easy music, but that's what we were given in high school, a black high school. So I was ready to go to college. When yeah. I auditioned for Wayne, uh, there was no problem. Wayne, as I said, did not have an opera program, but I continued to sing top-notch literature, choral literature, tenor solos, and that. So I was getting what I needed to prepare me to do what God had eventually prepared me to do. Teaching, wow. yes, but singing opera? No, no. In our household, we didn't listen to opera. Only a grand old opera on Saturday afternoons, because sure. both of my parents were from the South. Yeah. But I became interested. I, I took piano. My pa parents started me with piano lessons when I was five. And you also played an instrument because you were in the band. I was in the band that was formed at our church by one of our members, a little community band. And I played euphonium. And when it looked as though I was getting going to go to college and I began taking lessons on the euphonium and I went to college on a, an instrumental scholarship rather than a vocal scholarship. 
we got paid the $95 tuition every football season because that's when the band uh, performed. Yep. So I had a thorough musical education. The, I, I studied private voice and my teacher there and also the, the piano teacher that I continued with in Detroit was one of two organists in our church. She taught piano and she also taught me art songs. Uh, Schubert some Schubert. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was prepared fully to do what I didn't yeah. know I was going to do. So when, when the time came for you to study opera singing, you had such a grounding in music right. that the opera singing was an add-on to all of this preparation you had. Absolutely. When I studied with the teacher in Washington, Timmy Georgie, he is the first one to give me an idea of what operatic mm -hmm. technique would be. And my musical background enabled me to learn things quickly and thoroughly. Because there's a five roles I did at, at Tournau in 1959 were brand new for me. Yep. So I had a year in which to learn those. And I did. Uh, I created a study pattern, a study way of studying that enabled me to learn quickly. So when I wound up going to the Metropolitan Opera, the only opera that I had ever, operas I'd ever sung were the ones that I sang at Tournau. And then in 1960, I won the American Opera auditions, which took me to Italy to make a debut. I was and, wondering, uh, I was wondering how you got to Italy. So there, there were, tell, tell us about those auditions and what happened. The American Opera auditions were based, I think, in Minnesota, Minneapolis, I believe. And uh, it was one of the leading competitions during that time because it gave the winners a chance to go to Italy. The, the Italian singers on that side of it would come to America to make their debuts at Cincinnati in the summer opera season mm -hmm. in Cincinnati. Uh, so I won that year. Arlene Saunders, the late wow. Arlene Saunders won. The late Spiro Malas won, uh, and a Polakoff baritone won, and the Musetta for us was a soprano from, from uh, Quebec City, Constance Lambert. So we trekked off to Milan and Florence to do our debut, make our debuts there. And it was my first European experience. We arrived, this is very interesting, I think very important for young singers to understand. As I spent a lot of time working on pronunciation mm -hmm. and teaching. We arrived and we were met by the entourage headed by the Commendatore Colombo, who had been the mayor of Milano during the Second World War. And he was the chief official of the, uh, the auditions on that side uh, in Italy. And we were ushered into the big room where we were to do our first re piano rehearsal with the conductor, very nice man named Sergio Massaron. He was going to play the, the uh, uh, rehearsal for us. We were introduced to the prompter, an old gentleman who had prompted at La Scala for many years. And he sat down in front of us and opened his score. And we looked at each other and we said, we don't need a prompter. We don't use a prompter. I had studied with Boris Kodowski this summer, that summer. Really? Okay. And Boris was really hard on anyone who watched him when he was conducting. He said, no, 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 learn to use a peripheral vision. Mm -hmm. So that was ingrained in me. And I thought it was a bit, bit much not to, because the only time I saw him yell at anyone was when he caught somebody looking at him. So I thought, okay. So we started, the old fellow sat down and opened his score ready to give us the first word of every sentence that we were to sing. That's what prompters do. And we looked at each other, we, we don't need a prompter, we, we, we know it. And he was incensed. He slammed his score shut, sat there in front of us with his arms folded like this during the entire rehearsal. So we started, we didn't make any mistakes. And at the end of it, I swear to you, I looked at him and he looked like he was going to cry because he had never worked with singers who knew the music and could do, go through it without any mistakes, without him telling him. So they all gathered in the corner, gesticulating, looking over their shoulders because they had put aside an entire month to teach us the music. So they finally decided 
that they would bring us in every day, including weekends, to work on the pronunciation. Yeah. yeah. And we thought, Aye. but it's the best thing sure. that they could have done for us. Yeah. The reviews after opening night said, but of course the Italians can teach the Americans or something about this, singing. <laughs> Ma, la pronuncia era ottima. The pronunciation was excellent. <laughs> while disinvoltura sul palcoscenico, what freedom on stage. Well, yes, we were free because we weren't glued to the prompter and the conductor. Mm -hmm. we could, mm -hmm. I could sing toward Mimi, giving the impression that I was singing to her. And I could still see what was going on out here. So Boris's training was fundamental. In my class at Tanglewood that summer was Cheryl Milnes. I was just going to say, you know, uh, Cheryl goes on and on about what he learned from Boris. We were there that same summer. And then I went back in 1961 to prepare for my first Met season. And in that class was a young fellow named Justino Diaz. I became very good friends with Boris. I used to stay with he and his wife whenever I went to, to uh, Boston to sing. And I loved looking at the scrapbooks of his program that started in the 1940s, the photographs mm -hmm. of all the great American singers who studied with him, Leontine Price and Phyllis Curtin and all those, David Lloyd, all those people were there as young people getting mm -hmm. ready to start their careers. It was a blessing to work with Boris. Now, of course, a lot of um, Boris's work was you know, featured opera in English. Yes, that's right. Because he really wanted the, the American singer to connect with the meaning of what they were saying. And also for the American public yeah. to connect with it, because how many Americans speak and understand Italian? My first Carmen was with him in 1961 at the Wilbur Theater with Boris's company. Joan Wall was the Carmen who she was singing Small Rose at the Met at the time. And the other, there were two Carmens. One was Gabriel Brown, an African American car, a, a, a mezzo of wonderful talent who passed away far too soon. Uh, the baritone was guess who? Cheryl Mills, his first Escamillo. And there was a young fellow who was still a student at the New England Conservatory at that time, who sang Suniga, Justino Diaz. Wow. So, wow, wow. yes. That's, <laughs> that's all, just incredible. We all got our starts about the same time. Spiro Malas was the bass in Woodstock when I made my debut there. He was making his debut there. And then we wound up making our debuts in Italy together and wound up singing at Covent Garden and in Metropolitan Opera. How so, wonderful to have that long, long relationship with artists you, you grew up with. So, and I, and I, I heard you say here then that you had your summer in Woodstock and the next thing, you know, yes, you know, competition, you sang Rodolfo in, in Italy, but then you were in the Met National Council audition. Yes. And after I came back from Italy, I had $500 to my name because I took my wife with me because I didn't know when I was going to get back to Italy. Mm -hmm. So I, I also, when I was in Italy that uh, summer, I won second place in the Vercelli competition, which is a big singing competition. And uh, so I was feeling pretty good. I was having success with my competition winning aria, Nessun Dorma. And so I came back and I sent my wife back to Detroit to, so I could make a little bit of money to <laughs> take care of them. And I decided I was going to enter whatever competition I could. So I decided that I would enter the Met auditions. Now that wasn't the first time I entered the Met auditions. As I was getting out of the army and getting ready to go to Woodstock in 59, I decided to enter the Met auditions because I wanted to get some feedback mm -hmm. from people who knew what I was getting into because I didn't mm -hmm. know what I was getting into. So. I sang in the Middle Atlantic region auditions, in which Spiro Malis was also singing, and I lost. Spiro won third prize. First prize went to a soprano who was the wife of one of my colleagues in the, in the Army Chorus, and she went on to sing on Broadway. So I was standing there at the reception following the auditions, and the judges, John Gutman and Howard Hook, came up to me, and they said, we want you to know we like very much what we heard you do today. We don't think you're ready to go to New York for the semifinals, but keep doing what you are doing. That's all I needed to hear. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to hear. 
Yeah. I mean, I would have liked to have learned about it, but the, that, the fact that I didn't place didn't mean anything. It meant more to me to hear from these two men that I was on the right track. Now, what oh. you bring up is such an important point because I think a lot of young people, there are so many competitions these days and a lot of people enter them and they enter them, you know, studying voice is expensive, the money helps, but I don't think people pay attention enough to, you know, are you getting the feedback you need? Are you getting the, the green light at the, at the intersection that says, keep going, keep yeah. going? And what you were looking for in your auditioning for uh, these competitions was that, that sense that, yes, you're on the right path. Because here again, it was the first time for me to enter an, a competition on that level. So I needed to know that I was doing the right thing. Now, when I came back from Italy, I had won that competition in Italy and I thought, okay, I'm gonna re-enter the Met auditions because mm -hmm. I'm sort of riding on a crest right now. And indeed, I also in entered and won the uh, Gramercy Park uh, auditions that was done for the first time, the Gramercy Arts Club. So I was ready to, hmm. So I entered singing Nessun Dorma and also Paradiso. I, well, I, I got into the finals and it was interesting because John Gutman called me up when I was in the house, sort of rehearsing. He said, what are you going to sing for the finals? I said, well, I can sing O Paradiso or Nessun Dorma. He said, well, why don't you sing Nessun Dorma? So I said, okay, all right. So I went out and I sang Nessun Dorma. I think I probably got the biggest ovation that I ever got. <laughs> Even I got to sign to a contract. But there's a funny, there's a photograph of me. I think it was in the Saturday Review coming out on stage after I had been announced as the winner of the contract. Now, I had, I had no idea that I was going to win a contract. I thought that I was good enough to win some money. And that's mm -hmm. what I was there to mm -hmm. do because I, the money would have helped to fill the coffers, right? But when I was, I heard George Shirley is the winner of the Metropolitan Opera contract, I thought, uh. and the photograph of me, as I'm walking out, looks like I've just been hit over the head with a hammer. <laughs> it's like, uh. <laughs> yeah, but, and what's amazing is this is only a, a couple of years after you really began to take opera seriously. So you must have had a real natural gift and your teachers must have just taken that natural gift to another level. Well, that's it. I mean, first of all, I believe strongly that if it's not in you, it can't be developed. No one can put it in you. I've never been able to put a singing voice into anyone who doesn't have it. My job as a teacher is to help them to discover it if it's there, mm -hmm. and then to help them to develop it. But I can't put it in them. Right. So I was given the gifts when I was conceived. I didn't ask for them any more than I asked to be born. I was given those gifts and they were apparent to my parents and to others early on in my life. As I said, I was five years old. But again, I'm, for me, I've just been following a path and, and, uh, and, and acting out a script that was written for me before I was conceived, before I came into this world. And for that, I am grateful. And, and, and I think that attitude enables you to savor every minute of it, uh, mm -hmm. just to, to, not to bask in a prideful way, but just to recognize at every moment how, how blessed it is to have the gift. Yes, I, again, I, I didn't put it in me. I can only be grateful. I think that saying, yes, I did this, <laughs> right, right. is the worst case of false ego one can have. When I was a kid, one of the songs that I was given was Invictus. I don't know if you've ever yep. poem, Out of the Night That Covers Me, Black as a Pit from Pole, and it ends, uh, I, uh, whatever befalls, I am the captain of my fate. I am the, ma I'm the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And I sang that with great sense of authority, but then I've come to realize that that has never been the case. Yeah. Never. The intelligence that created me knows. I, I've often said, <laughs> every passing day is for God to know and me to find out. Hmm. I don't know what's going to happen the next moment. 
but I believe that it's hap it, it, the, the, the intelligence that created me knows. And I've just been following that path. And it, when there's been frustration, I've found it within me to keep following it. And when there's been success, I've found it in me to try to deal with that so that my head doesn't go because I didn't have anything to do with it. It was given how, to me. How did you manage the the pressure? Because auditioning for the Met is one thing. And by the time you were auditioning for the Met the second time, you really wanted it. You know, in 1957, it may have been, let's see what happens. In 1961, you wanted it. Oh, yeah. Uh, so you have the pressure of your own internal pressure of wanting to do well, wanting to win, whether for money or, wow, a contract. And here you are, unprecedented. Um, a, a Black singer had never won the Metropolitan Opera audition. And uh, a Black tenor in a leading role at the Metropolitan Opera, you were the first. Um, you had enough pressure to be excellent. Was it another kind, another layer of pressure to be the first time after time? Well, fr frankly, I could never think, I couldn't put that in my mind of being the first because that would have just, uh. what was in my mind was to do the work that I was given to do as best I could do it. And that is enough of pressure. That is enough of a chore, of a challenge to take this score to learn it, to try to get to a point of vocal comfort and security in performing it. I couldn't lay on top of that. The fact mm -hmm. that oh, when you walk out on stage, you know, everybody's gonna be saying, what is this black guy gonna do with this piece? I couldn't do that. I can't, I can't, I've learned that I cannot control what other people mm -hmm. will think in terms of what I do. I can only do what I've been given to do as well as I can do that thing. And that is enough. Mm -hmm. And that is what has gotten me through countless times. When, if I'd been thinking of, a, are they liking what I'm doing? Are they, are they, I couldn't think that. In 1961, was the Met a welcoming place? Yes. I had the people that I made my debut with, wonderful colleagues, Ted Upman, uh, Raji, Raji Elias, all of them. Only one report came to my ears through one of my colleagues of a soprano who was from the South, whom he had heard express reservations about my being there. That's the only report I received. Mm -hmm. That was the only encounter that I had with that from my colleagues. Yeah. Um, it was interesting because I, <laughs> years later, I sang with that particular soprano, mezzo soprano actually, and a performance of Carmen, not with a Met, but with a regional company. And it was, it was polite, we, we got along, we didn't really socialize or anything like that. And, uh, I've often said that I had the pleasure of, in the last act, stabbing her to death. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean... <laughs> you know, opera gives you those opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we, 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 the relationship was, it was cool. It was yep. just fine with me. It was all right. But yep. she didn't, uh, she wasn't nasty. I wasn't nasty. We did yep. the job that we were, we did the work. We did the job that we were able to do as best we could do it and the audience seemed to appreciate it. You worked with every great conductor in the world and I, when you when I read your biography and I see all the conductors you worked with I was curious whether any one or the other of them taught you something valuable was any of them really instructive to you as a, as a musician? Interestingly enough, I'd say more than one. One of them was Fausto Cleva. Hmm. A great old, just a great old name. Fausto Cleva knew every score that he conducted, like the back of his hand. And there were insights, because I said I made my debut as Rodolfo in Europe, but 
there were insights he brought to it that made me think more about okay how does this then how do i okay do you want to change what i've been thinking about this character or not um i enjoyed working a lot with colin davis in the uk i enjoyed working with uh, with um bernstein mm -hmm. i and with with um oh, senior moment a long time long-term conductor of the boston symphony uh, er schleinsdorf mm -hmm. and i'm sure i'm forgetting someone i mean it's it's um <laughs> been a while but uh, those names stand oh pierre boulez wow pierre boulez so yeah, i've just i've been blessed to work with great conductors Schulte I enjoyed working with Schulte a lot and uh, it, it should, the, the roster is is simply amazing Do, did you have role models um either singers you really admired like I want to sing like that or people who just managed their careers in a way where you thought that's a smart singer were there were there role models for you oh yeah um one of the first was a man who never sang operatically and that was Roland Hayes the great concert artist the first black internationally famous concert artist Roland Hayes tenor born in 1860 or 80 in Curryville Georgia and had a huge career as a concert artist recordings what have you throughout the 30s 40s 50s I first met him when I was an eight-year-old in Detroit, he came to my church in Detroit and sang the recital, and my parents made sure that I met him. And he was one of sort of the big three in our household musically. I added one, I'll explain that. But Roland Hayes, who gave Marian Anderson one of her first opportunities to sing before an audience that knew his career when he gave her an opportunity to sing on his recital on his recitals in Philadelphia so Marian Anderson but uh, Roland Hayes Marian Anderson Paul Robeson mm -hmm. and there's a fourth who wasn't a musician professionally but I found out years later that he had studied violin that was Joe Lewis heavyweight champion of the world wow <laughs> enough when I found out that he'd studied violin, I thought well, maybe that's the reason why he had that right hand. That could Isn't that, I didn't know that, how incredible. <laughs> but those were heroes for me when I was, from childhood when I was sure. growing up. Sure, sure. I met Hayes when I was eight. I had a chance to meet him again when I went to his final recital at Carnegie Hall when he was in his late seventies. And then for my radio program, Classical Music and the Afro-American that I put together for WQXR back in the seventies, I wanted to interview him and Robeson, but I went up to Brookline, Massachusetts to interview Hayes and he had a rough winter and he didn't want to do a live interview, but I sat with him for about an hour and just, we talked about his career, which was something that I'll, that hour I'll never forget. Now, he's the one who made his debut in Germany in the 1930s, I think 1930s. And he walked out on stage to a chorus of boos. And the audience booed him before he could even open his mouth. And he just stood there. And when they finally quieted down and stopped booing, he turned to his accompanist and changed the order of his program. And he began with Du bist die Ruhe of Schubert. Wow. At the end of his recital, he got a standing ovation. Now, this is Germany just before the Holocaust. Yeah. That's the kind of soul he had. He has his recordings are still available. It's still mm -hmm. out there. There was a very delicate voice, but there was a quality about it that, was, that came from his soul that wow. made him a superstar before Anderson blazed yeah. the scene. Yeah. So I, I remember your WQXR radio show when here in New York, I, when I was a kid, I would listen to it. Absolutely. So he was one of, he was probably my first model. There were others. 
uh, of, of color as well as, uh, as white. And <clears throat> one of whom I met later, much later when I heard him sing with the New York Philharmonic in about 1969, he came back, he was living in, in Amsterdam at that time. His name was Charles Holland. Now this guy had a beautiful lyric voice. He was so good that when he went to California, to Hollywood with a, a chorus to sing for one of the movies, I think it was uh, God's Got Wings, one of those movies about blacks and uh, he was in the chorus. He was signed to a contract to sing in movies, but he had to leave the States rather early because he became involved in uh, uh, with, uh, with someone that he shouldn't be coming with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he left and uh, with Dean Dixon, the, the, the conductor, the black conductor, and he lived in Paris. He was singing in a nightclub because his brother, he and his brother had a jazz background. Peanuts Holland was a very fine jazz trumpeter and, and Charles was, as I said, his brother. And so Charles was singing in a nightclub in Paris one night and someone came up to him after and said, Monsieur Holland, said, why did you not go sing uh, audition for the, the, the opera, the opera? And he said, they're doing magic flute. And he said, uh, no, I said, I, I, don't, I don't do Tamino. I mean, I don't do Monastus. But he said, no, no, go, go do it. So Charles went back and spoke to his wife who, who urged him to do it. So he went over, he said, I went over and I spoke to the, I sang and I spoke with the, the, the coach that played for me. And he said, well, Monsieur Holland, we, we, have, we have Tamino, we have uh, Monastitos. He said, no, no, he said, I don't do Monastitos, man. He said, I, I do Tamino. He said, but Monsieur Holland, Monsieur Genda is doing Tamino. <laughs> he said, no, 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 no. So it, he went back home and he asked his wife, he told his wife what happened. She said, well, look, they're doing a new production of uh, Pearl Fishers at L'Opera Comique. Why don't you go and go back to them and make a deal. See if you make a deal. If you, they give you an idea, then you do monastitos. So he swallowed his pride and he went back and they did. So to my knowledge, he was the first black tenor to sing at L'Opera. And he sang Nadir with the, 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 the uh, Opera Comique. This was a wonderful voice. Mm. I met him when I went to sing in Amsterdam to sing uh, uh, Peleas. He was living there and so we got together. And Dennis Russell Davies was conducting the Pelias. And so I told Dennis, I said, you know, there's this guy here who is a fabulous singer. He's not singing right now. He's, but he has sung, he had sung with the Amsterdam opera. I said, uh, I'd like for you to hear him. So he said, sure. So I went back to Charles. I said, look, sort of dry yourself out. He said, yeah, and, and you get yourself in shape because Dennis Russell Davies wants to hear you. So Charles rented the Concertgebouw concert uh, and sang an audition. He started off with Nature Immense from Damnation of Faust, and he sang a number of things. And I looked back over my shoulder to see what Dennis was doing. Dennis was like, whoa. Mm -hmm. Dennis hired him to come and sing with, at the Cabrillo Festival on two or three occasions with Dennis conducting him and accompanying him. And there's a recording of, of art songs, of French art songs with Dennis accompanying Charles and also the On Winlock Edge of Von Williams. Uh, it's, it's a recording I have, as a matter of fact. Uh, I can't think of the name of the, uh, the label right now. But then that opened up the possibility of Charles coming back. Now he's in his 70s now. And he came back and did a recital at Carnegie Recital Hall, which I attended. There were all of his old friends there. And then he met a, an entrepreneur who was from Detroit, who's living in California, who supported financially his coming back and giving a, con, a, a recital at Carnegie Hall. This was a voice. And he, when he came back to sing with the Phil, he was doing the, uh, the Airborne Symphony of uh, uh, American composer. I can't give his name now. Can't think of it. But uh, this was, he was a model for me when I got. Wow. Wow. Um, so there were, there were others. I mean, so UC Beerling, who's singing I loved, and unfortunately he passed away before I went to the Met. Nikolai Gedda. Oh, wonderful and, artist. Fabulous. Um, and I had to admire people like Richard Tucker and Franco Corelli. I mean, 
I wound up covering Corelli for Romeo and Juliet. And uh, I mean, it's, it, it, yeah, I had and I admired Luciano, whom I first heard when we were both singing at Covent Garden, <clears throat> 1967, I think it was. Wow. So, yeah, but I've learned not to listen to singers that I admire, tenors that I admire too often, because if I start to sing something that they've sung, then it's their voice that's in my ear and not my own. Right, right. And that's right. not a good thing. Yeah. I, when I was covering Corelli and uh, uh, Romeo, you know, at, at the Met, you always have to sit in the auditorium and write down the, the moves, the stage moves, because you may have to go in without having a staging. And so when we got to New House and I had to cover him, and I, I told the management, I said, look, I'm going to sit back in the lighting booth where I can't hear anything. I can mm -hmm. still see what's going on on stage, but I can't hear him sing because when I hear him doing this, you know, it's going to come out of me that way. And it's not going to sound like him. Right. It's got to sound like me. Right. So I did that. And well, that's did. great. That's great advice for any young singer. And, you know, here you are. Uh, you know, after such a distinguished career, going back to university life, University of Maryland, and then, of course, the University of Michigan. And you trained as a, as a music educator, and you became a music educator. And what, for you, was the special reward of working with young people? Well, I started, as I said, as a teacher on the, on the high school level. I, I love, there's something in me that loves sharing musical ideas and seeing them take shape and technical ideas on the academic level, certainly, but seeing them take shape, seeing the, the things that what I've learned and stolen from my colleagues and <clears throat> passing on to young singers. I, I believe that's the reason why I had a career. As I said, my career is interrupted by military service and then interrupted big time because of the singing career but i got back into teaching well before going to maryland uh i was living in montclair new jersey and i was in, i went to dinner at a neighbor's house and i met the president of staten island community college who said would you consider coming out when you're in town coming out and working with some of our students and i thought yeah because I always knew I was going to get back to teaching. This was about 1973. I said, yeah, I, I'd like to do that. So I went out and taught a number of classes for about a year, and then they ran out of money. Um, but before that, I had met uh, someone in an acting class. I, I had, a, I had a, an operation that made me take some time off. And uh, during that time in, in Montclair, we had a theater company called the Whole Theater Company, run, founded run, and run by Olympia Dukakis mm -hmm. and her husband. And, and uh, they lived in Montclair. And so I went and took some lessons from her brother, Apollo Dukakis, because I wanted to just get a sense of what it's like to be a straight actor. And I also at that time met a person who had founded a dance company. And she invited me to become artistic director of this school, which we changed, changed the name of to the uh, New School for the Arts. And we included dance, we included music. And I started teaching uh, uh, classes and teaching privately. That honed my skills for the academic level. And I did that until I was asked to come and join the faculty uh, at the University of Maryland in 1980. So even when I started my career in the 50s, I knew in the 60s, I knew that I would return to teach you because it was in me to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and just, the, re the, the rewards of it just, oh, do yeah. you, even though so many of your students don't have the gift that will give them a career, still the pleasure of nurturing what is within them. Absolutely, because here again, no one knows. I tell my students, you don't know what you're going to do. You're here right now because you belong here. I can't tell you what's going to happen after you leave here. All I can do is try to share with you what I've learned and so that you're prepared to take it to the next level, whatever that level is going to be. And more of them have gone into other areas of function than singing. One of my students took his doctorate with me, tenor, really wanted to sing. 
he taught for a couple of years in academe and then things in his personal life changed and he married he married a new a soprano who's sort of Wagnerian size voice and he was unhappy with the way she was being managed so he gave up his teaching career and apprenticed himself to Columbia Artists Management and he stayed with them until he was told at one point he said I was told that we were all, all of the apprentices were gathered together and told, you know, we're not about managing careers, we're about making money. He said, Professor Shirley, I, I can't do that. So he left and apprenticed himself to the Barrett Agency, mm -hmm. finished his apprenticeship there, and now is a very important manager in New York City, Robert okay. Mirchak. Robert sure. Mirchak. Yeah. So he didn't know at that point when he was getting his doctorate that he was going to become an artist's manager, yeah. but everything yeah. that he studied has prepared him to be an artist's manager. Yeah. He knows voice. He knows what the, the difficulties are and the challenges will be. And others have gone on to become business persons and so mm -hmm. forth. I tell them, I tell my students, you're here to do the work that is demanded of you to do. It is not going to be lost because everything you learn here can be applied in many ways to whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing with your life. So it's no, nothing is lost. I ask people, you know, what's the most identifiable musical entity at the University of Michigan? What would the public identify? The marching band. Hmm. Yeah. Some 300 some students strong. At no time is there more than say 6% of that number from the School of Music, Theater and Dance. Mm. But they're out there practicing, rehearsing their instruments, blah, 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 blah. learning what that can do to enhance and influence what they're going to do. So your time is not wasted here unless you choose to waste it. So, so many people must ask you for career advice. Any, any singer, uh, any black tenor, uh, any uh, wannabe teach, voice teacher. <laughs> is there um, a through line? Are there themes? Is there a primary theme to the advice you give to the young singer who comes to you saying, Mr. Shirley, Professor Shirley, what should I, you know, what's your advice? Well, it depends on where they are and what, you know, what my experience is of them <clears throat> at that time. Um, I've just had a couple of kids who are graduating <laughs> bonding me with this, this uh, these questions. First of all, I say, look, I can't make the decisions for you. I can share with you what I feel for you at this point. First of all, do the work that is before your nose to do. If it is a gap year, then in which you're not going to be in academe, continuing your progress in a planned, structured program, then structure a program for yourself so that you're not going to be wasting time and losing ground. If that means continuing to work on languages, then do that, either using your app to do it, speaking, recording yourself so that it sounds like what it's supposed to sound like, not what you think you just did, but what you just did so that you can make corrections. Vocalizing, you've given, given them a series of vocal leases to do every day to strengthen your, your sense of your voice and your understanding of it and its ability to do what it is you want to do. So plan it out. Um, Yes, you have to work, but find a time, dedicate a time in your work day or after your work day or before your work day to take care of your vocal growth and find a time to take care of your musical growth. And if there's something that is calling you outside of music, something that has struck you as being, well, this is the way I want to go, then follow it. Follow it. Listen, be in tune, be in touch, because it is you finally, not somebody else.
Yeah. I can want, you know, I, I can say to you, but we've spent all this time developing and you're gonna do what? No, you have to do what calls on you from inside to do. And know that because you're not gonna be doing what we've been studying, it's not something that you have to totally abandon. Mm -hmm. It, has, it will be with you because this is a gift you've been given and it's up to you to sort that out here again i use myself as an example i wanted to teach that was it i was singing i do can you do that but there was another plan that i had to listen to and that really took over mm -hmm. it took over and <laughs> my career has been one where I've, you know, I've just followed along. I mean, I've, my plans at times have not worked out. And that means that the plan of the intelligence created me is, has taken over. So I, I come through it. I'm always amazed when I look back at what I've been able to do. I've, I'm amazed at that because most of it I didn't plan to do. Wow. Well, um, George Shirley, it is an inspiration to listen to you, to hear the truth and the, the, the integrity of what you share with us. It's a complete inspiration. Um, such an honor to have this time with you this afternoon. And uh, I'm grateful for every bit of your contribution to Opera in America. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you very much. And I appreciate your interest in what I've done and for all of us who are chosen to do this wonderful thing of speaking this language that is music. Yeah, Thank for you. sure. Well, I will look forward to seeing you in a couple of months here when we unveil our Hall of Fame and you'll be an inaugural class member. In the meantime, I, I just wish you a good spring and a good summer and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Yes, be safe, be healthy. Be careful and thank you so much. And you too, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye.